a genre-mixing cartoon enthusiast and the epitome of a character actor form a lifelong friendship in today's episode of Deadly Duos. So today's episode is a little bit different, as one of our subjects, Dick Miller, had 184 credits on IMDb, many of which being hard-hitting and vital roles such as Cab Driver and Man in Bed, or the ever-popular Third Corpse. Don't get me wrong, Dick Miller is an absolute legend, but to go over all his roles when he wasn't working with Dante wouldn't make sense. That being said, if you are interested, I highly recommend you seek out the documentary That Guy Dick Miller. It is a great exploration of a beloved character actor. Like a future present to all genre lovers, Dick Miller was born on Christmas Day in the Bronx, New York in 1928. Before acting, his life took him to the military with a stint in the Navy and even winning a title as a middleweight boxer. He would eventually earn his PhD in psychology from New York University, which file that under things I didn't expect to learn about Dick Miller, before moving to LA to become a writer. It was then in 1955 that he would begin a ridiculously long film career that would span 60 plus years. His first film would be Apache Woman, helmed by another legendary filmmaker, Roger Corman. Miller's first 14 roles would actually be under Corman, but we'll come back to our friend Roger in a future episode, I promise. His first major role, and one that would influence not only his future character names, but get his foothold in the horror genre, was the 1959 Roger Corman horror film Bucket of Blood. Miller would have one of his very few starring roles here as the slow-on-the-take busboy named Walter Paisley, who becomes a star artist in the beatnik world and whose art becomes increasingly more deadly as it grows in popularity. His work here with Corman would lead to his extended partnership with Joe Dante. As I said earlier, to go over the entire Dick Miller catalog would not only miss the point of this video, but also destroy the YouTube algorithms with a 59 minute video essay. So instead, I'll just highlight the genre fair that viewers of this channel will either remember or can seek out to view the usually 90 seconds or so of screen time he would work in. We have 1960's The Little Shop of Horrors, the Terror from 1963, The Terminator and the TV miniseries V The Final Battle in 84, the wonderful late night TV duo of Night of the Creeps and Chopping Mall in 1986, 30 episodes of the TV series Fame from 84 to 87, wait what? Yeah, he was a recurring character named Lou Mackey, and you should really check out some clips of this to see something a little different from our guy here. Anyway, also check out Amityville 1992 from 1992, and 1995's Demon Knight, which is a personal favorite of mine. The other half of today's duo, Joe Dante, was born in Morristown, New Jersey in 1946 and from a young age absolutely fell in love with cartoons. If you've ever seen a Joe Dante film, you will either see scenes that are basically live action cartoons or have actual real cartoons from the 30s and 40s with characters, often younger characters, getting lost in what they are seeing, very much like Dante did himself as a child. His life-changing job would turn out to be as a trailer editor at Roger Corman's New World Pictures in 1974. This would lead to his directorial debut just two years later with Hollywood Boulevard. Corman liked to take chances on young talent that he thought could work out well as A, they were cheap to hire, and B, his movies always made a profit back. Hollywood Boulevard is a heartfelt send-up of B-movies of all genres, from creators like Al Adamson and Corman himself following the fictional movie studio Miracle Pictures, as the cast and crews of the film will do whatever it takes to get a movie made. You get to see a little bit of the genius of Corman here, as he used a lot of footage from some of his own films to fill the runtime and mask them as the movies that Miracle Studios was currently working on. Right from his first film, Dante would have the privilege to work with Dick Miller, with Miller here playing a character named Walter Baisley. If that name sounds familiar, it's because it's the same name as Dick Miller's breakout character from Bucket of Blood. This would become kind of a running joke, as Miller would play the character with a variation of that name numerous times throughout his long career. The film, like many Corman productions, would make all of its money back and then some, grossing about a million on a sub $60,000 budget, and critics giving it middling reviews seeing it as the parody that it was meant to be. Two years later would bring audiences the pair's first horror collaboration with the animal attack film Piranha. The film follows a swarm of genetically engineered piranhas originally developed by the US government to fight in the Vietnam War, being unleashed on a resort town. Piranha was part of the group of animal attack films released by Corman's studio to capitalize on the success and craze created by Jaws three years prior. Dick Miller gets cast here as Buck Gardner, who is the owner of the resort that is getting attacked. He fills a similar role to that of the mayor in Jaws, with his concerns being more in line with his own reputation and making money than the safety of his own patrons. This film would be popular with audiences and make $16 million on only a $770,000 budget, which itself is fairly high for a Corman film. Its popularity would spawn, sorry, I, I can't help myself sometimes, 
a sequel, which would help Corman introduce another powerhouse creator, James Cameron, to the world, as well as remakes in 1995 with a not well liked TV version, and a pretty fun 2010 version by Alejandro Aja. After uncredited acting and directing work for Miller and Dante in 1979's Rock and Roll High School, 1981 would usher in one of the great werewolf movies of all time. The Howling was released the same year as John Landis's An American Werewolf in London, and the production of these two films really could use its own video. The Howling follows a TV reporter played by Dee Wallace, who goes to a retreat to mentally recover after helping the police catch a serial killer. The problem is that the camp is made up of werewolves, and they are trying to get Wallace to join. Miller here plays a book and antiquity store owner, again named Walter Paisley, who sells a couple of the main characters' books on werewolves, and eventually the silver bullets needed to stop them. The film is littered with character actors like Miller, and even includes a cameo from the duo's old mentor, Roger Corman. The film was a smash success with critics and audiences, and would lead to an almost unfathomable seven sequels spread across 30 years. After working on an episode of Police Squad together in 1982, the next major collaboration would be in the segment for the film adaptation of Rod Serling's all-time great TV show The Twilight Zone in 1983. As one of the four directors doing segments on the film, Dante remade the famous episode It's a Good Life, where a boy with powerful telekinetic powers can basically do whatever he wants, and does, if anyone doesn't make him happy. Dante decided to keep the name of the segment and featured many of his stable of character actors, including Mr. Miller, of course, again here playing Walter Paisley. God, that character can't catch a break. Dante's trademark cartoon style here really comes alive, as a literal cartoon comes alive to eat one of the characters stuck in the house with the power mad kid. As with most anthology films, The Twilight Zone is uneven and is unfortunately associated with one of the saddest behind the scenes stories ever to occur. You should check out Shudder's Cursed Films episode on it, as well as our WTF Happened episode for more. The film ended up being popular with fans as it quadrupled its budget, taking in over $40 million. Without missing a beat, 1984 would get gremlins forever put into our pop culture lexicon. I always revisit this movie in December, but let me know in the comments if this is more of a horror film or a Christmas film to you guys. The plot, like I even need to say it here, is about an amateur inventor bringing home a truly unique Christmas gift for his family with a very strict set of rules that absolutely need to be followed. Gizmo the Mogwai is as cute today as he was 36 years ago, and the film is equal parts kooky and scary. This was a staple for me as a kid, and one of the first horror films I showed to my own children. Miller gets a more substantial role here as the curmudgeonly old neighbor of Billy the main character. His character, Mr. Futterman, even gets one of the most intense scenes in the film when one of the titular gremlins chases him down with his own snowplow. The film was another smash hit, Dante's biggest ever in fact, making over $212 million on an $11 million budget, and being immortalized in comic books, toys, video games, and action figures decades on. Following on the heels of Gremlins was another genre mix of a kid's film and sci-fi adventure with the explorers. The film would be the polar opposite of Gremlins in terms of success, with it losing 10 million in theaters, but it would give us the first on-screen roles for both Ethan Hawke and River Phoenix. Dick Miller makes his appearance here as Charlie Drake, and the film follows Hawke and Phoenix's characters building a spacecraft to explore the outer regions of space. This movie really should have been a hit, with Industrial Light and Magic doing the effects, and none other than The Thing's Rob Bottin on makeup, but unfortunately the studio forced Dante to push out an unfinished product that was eaten alive in the wake of the previous week's release of uh, uh, some little film called Back to the Future. Eager to get back to work, but needing a break from the film industry, 1986's lone entry for the duo was an episode of Steven Spielberg's Ode to Twilight Zone, Amazing Stories. The episode, written by genre-heavy Mick Garris, was a bizarro take on Gremlins, with a greeple wreaking havoc in a woman's home and eating all of her inanimate objects. Dick Miller shows up here as the mailman, but the star of this is really the creature effects itself. As with much of his other work, this leans much more into live-action cartoon territory and is fairly different from other episodes, even his own other episode in a previous season. The very next year would bring two more projects, the sci-fi spoof Amazon Women on the Moon and an 80s classic with Inner Space. Amazon Women on the Moon was a spoof film along the lines of the far superior Kentucky Fried movie, but as a send-up to the 1950s science fiction genre. It did not fare well at the box office or with critics, and has been cut into multiple different versions for both TV and home video releases. Unfortunately, Dick Miller is only in a deleted scene, so you might not see him depending on which version you watch. Dante was also one of five credited directors, which usually doesn't end well for movies. Their other collaboration that year, Inner Space, was a loose remake of Fantastic Voyage from 1966 and had his biggest budget and biggest stars to date. Meg Ryan, Dennis Quaid, and Martin Short starred in this film about a military man, played by Quaid, asked to shrink down and enter a rabbit as part of an experiment only to be accidentally put into Martin Short's character when the experiment is interrupted by a rival company. 
As a comedy adventure film, it mostly works, and we get the usual Dick Miller sighting in the small role of cab driver. While winning an Oscar for visual effects and garnering mostly positive reviews, it was not another box office success. A couple years would pass before we got The Burbs in 89. The Burbs is an all-time classic to close up the 80s with Tom Hanks and a great comedy mystery story. That and Gremlins are probably what I associate Dante with the most. Also starring Carrie Fisher, Corey Feldman, and Bruce Dern, it follows Tom Hanks' character Ray suspecting his neighbors of foul play and spending the bulk of the movie trying to prove it. This was finally another hit for Dante as it received above average reviews and took in nearly triple its budget. While Miller is sidelined into minor character status, this time as a garbage man alongside other frequent Dante collaborator Robert Ricardo, he is memorable and had fun doing it. 1990 would give us the only sequel Dante would do in his entire career. While known as a journeyman director, often taking on movie or TV projects that varied in genre and tone, he was primarily remembered as the guy that brought Gremlins to life, and the studio certainly remembered the box office returns. Given a massive budget this time of $50 million and almost complete creative control of the project, Gremlins 2 The New Batch is one of the most fun failures in cinema history. It is a satire, a horror comedy, and a love letter to all the things that Dante loved growing up, including getting some original animation from one of his heroes, animator and legend Chuck Jones. Along with Phoebe Cates, Zach Galligan, and Dick Miller returning to their original roles, we get Christopher Lee, John Glover, and Robert Prosky in great supporting turns. The New Batch, which is still one of the great sequel titles of all time, follows the same formula as the first film, but this time traps the main characters with the gremlins in a super high-tech high-rise building. Miller gets much more to do this time around, and even gets to fight off one of the more creative gremlin mutations when he throws the bat gremlin into cement before it hardens into a gargoyle on the side of a building. Unfortunately, unlike the first film, Gremlins 2 is a failure for the critics and the fans, failing to even bring back its inflated budget. This would also be the last major collaboration between the two. Miller would continue to appear in small roles in a number of Dante projects, from 1993's Matinee as a former B-movie star, talk about meta, to 1996 with Small Soldiers, and in what was a dream project for Dante with 2003's Looney Tunes Back in Action. All of these varied in critical and box office successes, and had Miller in very small parts. Their final two collaborations were not even speaking roles for Miller, with the horror releases of The Hole in 2009 and Burying the X in 2014. Sadly, there can be no future collaborations, even if we are to be graced with a Gremlins 3, as Dick Miller passed away in 2019 at the age of 90. It does warm my heart, though, that his final role would be in 2019's Hanukkah, a B-horror movie, and his character name? You guessed it. Paisley. For Dante, he has mostly been relegated to TV episodes like the reboots of MacGyver and Hawaii Five-0, rather than big-budget film releases, but I would recommend fans of this channel seek out his two episodes of the horror anthology Masters of Horror, and look for his segment in the anthology horror film Nightmare Cinema. That's it for this episode, but let me know in the comments what your favorite collaboration between the two is, and I'll see you next month right here on Joe Blow's Deadly Duos.